They say life is a game of chance. You roll the dice and hope for the best. And in this case, you woke up with pocket aces because you're about to enjoy a brand new episode of The Point. All about, what else? Gambling. So stick around. Welcome to The Point. I like to keep it real on this program, and I'm going to let you know that on today's show, we're going to talk about something that I know very little about, gambling. But the great thing about this show is we all get to learn together, and we have three experts on gambling that can kind of give us, uh, you know, the ins and outs, you know, what's really going on with gambling. And there are three different topics that we're going to focus on. The first is gambling addiction. Of course, we've got to talk about that. Uh, then we're going to talk about the government monopoly on lotteries. Is that right? And uh, what can we do to change it? And then finally, we're going to talk about Hollywood's depiction of gamblers and gambling. Is it reality? Are they basically showing gamblers as something that they're really not? We're going to have the three experts talk about that as well. But before we get to those topics, let's meet our three experts. First, we have Tim Fong. He is an associate clinical professor of psychiatry at the UCLA Neuropsychiatric Institute and Hospital. He is the co-author of UCLA's Gambling Studies Program and also the director of the UCLA Impulse Control Disorders Clinic, which I find fascinating, especially considering the fact that maybe some of our YouTube commenters have you know, impulse control disorder. <laughs> just some, just some. But of course, we have a very intelligent audience that will probably enjoy the show. And then Annie Duke uh, is a multi-championship winning professional poker player, author of two books on poker, a regular performer with spoken word storytelling organization, The Moth, and also a one-time contestant on Celebrity Apprentice, which I find fascinating because you made a conscious decision to be close to Donald Trump. <laughs> I regret it too. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, maybe I'll ask you about that in the no, show. Yeah. And uh, last but certainly not least, Michael Schur is well known to the TYT audience as Epic Politics Man. He is a regular guest host on The Young Turks, as well as a political correspondent and host on Current TV. He also hosted the political show 2012 this past year on The Young Turks Network. Michael, um, Annie is uh, actually successful at gambling. I hear you're quite the opposite. Yeah, I had a, a storied, <laughs> unsuccessful gambling career. It doesn't stop me from doing it, uh, but I, it, it happened really early, and I can't wait to talk about it. All right, mm -hmm. sounds good. Well, let's get to our first point, and it comes to us from Steve Tromans, a UK-based therapist and founder of JustBeWell.com. He's actually going to talk to us about gambling addiction. Let's take a look. Compulsive gambling and how to stop doing it the easy way. I have seen hundreds of people to get them to stop gambling over the last dozen or so years since I've been doing this kind of thing. I have seen people who've gambled their lives away. I've seen people who've stolen money. I've seen people who've stolen their parents' jewelry and sold it so they could gamble. And they felt awful about it and terrible about it, and yet they found themselves doing it again. If you have been gambling compulsively, then understand that some people out there, like myself, do understand what it's like. When you're a compulsive gambler, the winning is almost irrelevant. It's the feeling that you get of the activity that draws you to it. It's a kind of stimulus response that you have the idea of putting the bet on, and that's what draws you. I know some people who put the bet on and don't even watch the horse race if it's a horse race. It's not so important to them. Now this is a conditioned response. You learned to do this. It's not your fault. You didn't, do, you didn't wake up going, right, today shall I be a happy human being? Or shall I go and gamble everything away and feel really drawn towards it and then like shit afterwards when I haven't got anything left? You put a bet on and it loses and you go, well, I better put another bet on to get that back. Um, or you win a bit of money and then you go, right, okay, now I'm in the flow. And you win more money and more money and more money. And then suddenly it's all gone and you go, ah. So my job is to get you, not simply not to do this, but to get you to make gambling completely a thing of the past. You can get back in control of your life. Remember that every single time you gambled is in the past, and the future is something you will create. And when you know how to create what you want, you can create it. So lots of interesting points made in that video. And when I think of you know my personal experience with gambling, I remember the very first time I did it, I won $1,000 on a penny slot. And it was this great feeling. It's like, oh my god, you can get rich quick. Um, but then I proceeded to lose that money and more. And then, of course, as he mentions in that video, I wanted to keep gambling so I could win that money back. But it doesn't work out that way. Now, as I'm watching that, I'm thinking about my own story. And I'm thinking, am I an addict? I mean, 
how are there gradations? Is it a black and white issue? Tim, what do you think? Oh, absolutely. There's a clear difference between someone who compulsively gambles versus someone who is a compulsive gambler. Now, in your story, the story stopped after you lost some money. What's the reason you didn't keep on doing it over and over? That's a fascinating question. Pathological gambling, in short, is a brain disease characterized by a set of gambling behaviors that create harm, and you keep on doing it over and over. It's not fun. It's not about entertainment anymore. It's about just sustaining action. And in the end, people do it despite all these harmful consequences to themselves, their families, and society. So what causes that? I mean, it's fascinating because they're putting themselves through torture while they're losing all that money. You know, of all the patients I've, I've seen, none of them have said, I want to become a pathological gambler. Just like all my patients said, I don't want cancer, I don't want to be depressed. Pathological gambling is a brain disease. You think of it just like diabetes or asthma or any other medical illness comes from a biological, psychological, and social causes. We have genetic causes, we have psychological causes, but at the end of the day, what it is, is the brain has changed its functioning. It no longer controls impulses, self-control, the ability to stop. Just like you know, with depression or anxiety, and you don't want to wake up feeling like you want to kill yourself, but you do. It's just like that with pathological gambling. You wake up, I don't want to gamble today, but I do. Now, Annie, you've made millions of dollars through gambling. You've been a very successful poker player. And was there ever a point in your gambling career where you thought, you know, maybe there's a possibility I'm addicted to this or anything like that? I mean, what do you think about gambling addiction? So, well, first of all, I think I've seen a lot of people who are addicted to gambling, and it's really painful to watch. You know, I've watched people ruin their lives. I've made zero money through gambling, so I don't really know how to speak to that because what I do isn't gambling. Mm -hmm. um, so when you, the definition of gambling is playing when you are at a disadvantage and you're just hoping to overcome it. Um, now you can play poker at a disadvantage. Um, and in fact, gambling addicts often will. Even gambling addicts who could be very good poker players will in some sense, it looks like almost on purpose, but because of the addiction will play in a manner that puts them at a disadvantage. But if you're working at an advantage, it's just the same as saying, oh, someone who runs a business that has an 11% margin or whatever, they're gambling, right? So I run a business, I place bets, I know what the mathematical outcome of the bet is supposed to be, I know whether it's a money-making bet or not. So I haven't personally experienced that. I don't, I've never felt the need to go into a casino. I don't play craps, I don't play Baccarat, I don't play any of that stuff. But I've certainly seen a lot of people do it and it's, it's a very devastating thing to watch. So for the audience members that might not understand um, how you're trying to differentiate right now, how is poker, the way you play poker, different from someone going into a casino and playing poker? So everything is about whether you have an advantage or not, right? So like if I go play blackjack, there's no decisions that I make during the hand. They deal me my cards, and whether I play the bank or the house, I lose 2.5% of my money. And no matter what I do, I'm going to lose 2.5% of my money. I might win on this particular try, but over the course of all the times that I play blackjack, I'm going to lose 2.5% of whatever the volume of betting that I do is. So in poker, because I'm playing against other players... By the way, in my case, it's like 30.5%. <laughs> <Is that right? laughs> In poker, if I'm playing against other players, if I'm a better decision maker than they are and I understand the math of the game better, I'll be playing an advantage over them because the house doesn't build an edge in. Mm -hmm. Okay, So I can make very bad decisions. So in poker, we have something that we call tilt, which is being really emotional and allowing it to, to make a decision that you know is mathematically wrong, but you're just like, I don't care. I'm going to try to get lucky. So you do see that happen to people. I don't. It's not something that really happens to me very much. Actually, it happened to me on The Apprentice, but it doesn't really happen to me at the poker table. Um, so, but, um, so that's what the difference is. It's like any time you have a mathematical advantage, like I'm betting a dollar, my return should be a dollar twenty, mm -hmm. then I'm not playing to a disadvantage and I'm no longer gambling. But I can make a decision where I'm betting a dollar and my return should be 93 cents or something. And then I'm playing at a disadvantage, and that will happen to you if you get sort of emotionally out of control, or if you're just not a good player, which mm -hmm. there's lots of people who aren't good players. So do contestants on The Apprentice actually get paid for their participation on the show? Yes. So you were gambling your sanity, and you made money off that, didn't <laughs> you? <laughs> that's, that's right. That's a good way to put it, yes. So apparently uh -huh. I need to go see Dr. Fong. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, Michael, share your experience with the I audience. I mean, my experience with, with gambling is I'm a classic hack gambler. I love gambling. I have very little vice in my life. I don't really drink. I've never smoked. I'm not. But gambling from, I got, um, in New York, I got a fake ID like everybody did. 
Um, and all of my friends went to buy beer, and I went to OTB, which is off-track okay. betting in New York. And I was standing with you know doormen and newspaper delivery men betting two dollars on a horse race. I loved it from the get-go. And then near my high school, there was a bookie parlor where you could like it was fronted by uh, it was a general store, and you'd go in the back, and there were these you know two big fat guys sitting there taking bets on football games on, on whatever. There's something called the number. Uh, there were numbers runners at that time. No, no, I never knew anything about the number, but I would bet on the number, and I'd go back the next day and say, what was the number yesterday? It was three, I bet six. I put a dollar, I didn't even know what I was betting on. There's just this, there's a, a sense of danger, there's a sense of excitement, and there is, it, when you grow up, and you are anybody who thinks rationally, it, it defies any of that, because you, you fly into Vegas, you see huge hotels, we, we all know the story. You go, they're, they're monstrous, and they keep getting bigger and bigger, and they're giving free things away. It, it's, a, it's a dumb play, but you still do it because of you know, what Dr. Fong said. I mean, you, you, I think the idea here is, for me, is that I am the perfect shill for this thing, because I, you know, I, I think I can win, I love the action, I forget about the losses if I get the win. You know, Andy said, yeah, maybe I'll lose a, you know, win a couple of times, have a big win. But you, when you have that win, you forget about all the other losses you had, so it just feels good for a moment. That's fascinating, because when I'm gambling, I dwell on the losses. I can't stop thinking about the fact that, oh my god, I just lost like $60. I could have yeah. bought, you know, I could have purchased a new pair of shoes for that, for instance. And that's constantly going on in the back of my mind. With these individuals that have severe gambling addictions, do they have that thought process at all? Like, is there something in their head at all telling them, you know what, I need to stop? Or is that completely gone? Like, Yeah, you know, it's a great Great question. We've seen a lot of wide range. Some folks have battled that. I, I, I just need to stop versus others. I love gambling. It's what I do. It's what I breathe. So um, just like in any other disease, we see a wide variety of uh, presentations and symptoms. But that's very common. Uh, we call it the gambler's fallacy. We have cognitive distortions. Gamblers come into my office and say, well, black has lost 10 times in a row uh, on roulette. Therefore, red is due. Mm -hmm. And you say, no, it's not. It's the same odds. You say, no, it is. It goes back to this fascinating thing about gambling. Why are people so attracted to gambling? This notion of putting up something of value at risk on, on an event of uncertain outcome. It makes no sense intellectually. It has everything to do about touching our core of who we are as humans. We want to control things that are uncertain. We want to seek out rewards. We want to get things easy without working for it. You know, all the way back to the caveman days, if I kill a bear, that's a lot of work. But if Michael kills that bear and I get that bear from Michael, that's, that's what I want to do. It naturally gets my adrenaline and natural juices flowing. So when you're in the office with me, and if you ever had a chance to see that, these are the conversations we have with patients, trying to help them distill out what's altered in their thinking about gambling and what's altered in their ability to control their behavior. Tim, how, mu how much of it is about danger, too? I mean, I lived in a very safe, sheltered life, right? And I, yeah. was, I was in a back room with people who were literally part of the, the Lucchese crime family. They were the yeah. brother of Vinny the Chin Gigante. And I loved going in and, and being part of that place. Yeah. I loved, you know, it wasn't, you know, it, uh, betting $5 when I was in 10th grade was dangerous because $5 is right. a lot. Mental right love. now, $5, I couldn't care. It, it only becomes sexy right. to me when it's a little bit dangerous. You know, it's what, again, it's what was the draw to. You know, most of our gamblers that we talk to, it's not about winning, it's yeah. not about losing, it's about avoidance, it's about escape, it's about the thrill of the chase. Yeah. In fact, the worst moment is when you're out of money when you no longer have the ability to gamble. That's when they get more suicidal, more depressed. So again, for each person is different. In your case, it may be about the scenery, the, the novelty, the right. what could happen. Yeah. That's the natural part of us as humans. We want uncertainty in our lives. Otherwise, why do we watch the same movies, the same style of movies? We know yeah. how it's gonna end, but we're always uncertain how it's gonna unravel. Right. Or sports, we know one team is gonna win, but we always, we don't know how it's gonna turn out. So uncertainty is the thing that really drives human interest in something. Right. Uh, and I think that that's exactly what happened in your case. I think there's also this idea of like, when you look at, for example, like Chinese culture where luck is so built into it, and like a lot of the stuff that happens around New Year's is trying to figure out if you're gonna be lucky for the rest of the year. I think there's a thrill in overcoming the odds, feeling like somehow you're special. Mm -hmm. 
you know? And I think that that's like a big draw for people. Like, I know I was supposed to lose, but look at how much I won. Like, right. you listen to people on the plane, like I would take Southwest on a Friday night. I'd try to avoid it, but sometimes you'd end up there. <laughs> um, and there'd be people who would be so happy and talking about how they're gonna overcome it. And yeah. everybody knows that those casinos exist. Like, they weren't built out of zero dollars. Yeah. Yeah. And so everybody knows that they're battling against the odds, but they think they're gonna be the special ones. Right. They get to win, and I think you get a lot of feeling of like, look, I, I did something that's unusual, like I'm a special person. I have, there's some special supernatural thing going right. on about I'm lucky. Yeah, and you know what's so funny? When, when I go to a casino and I, uh, listening to what Annie was saying about the difference between poker and uh, that you're not a gambler, you're, you, have, you bring a skill set that you know is gonna percentage wise be more successful, is I'm intimidated by the poker room. Right, right yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and I, I'll walk up to a blackjack. Oh, I, I can be on you know, nothing, but the blackjack table probably has a better shot of creaming me than the poker does, sure. or it will be a slow bleed at the poker table. But it, everything that I sort of think about myself gets thrown out the window when I walk into a casino. The the, the logic, the the yeah. reason, all of that. And so, so let's talk about the environment of the casino itself, because I think that it could play, well, not yes. could play, but it does play a huge role in fueling some addictions. Mm -hmm. You know, just off the top of my head, the story of Terrence Watanabe mm -hmm. comes to mind. I don't know if you guys are familiar with him, but he lost $127 million off this like weekend gambling spree in Vegas. He went to two casinos, he lost that amount of money, and now he's suing those casinos knows because he felt that they were creating an environment that would fuel his addiction. They were giving him alcohol. You know, of course, there are no windows, no clocks, so you have no sense of what's really going on around you. Are you guys buying uh, his argument? Do you think that uh, these casinos are fueling the addiction and they should be somehow regulated or something? I think that they're definitely, they're, they're, they definitely do things that play into cognitive bias, right? So uh, if you're a big back, back around player, they'll give you a sheet so that you can mark whether the player or the bank won each hand. Mm -hmm which is irrelevant, right. right? We just talked about that. That's totally irrelevant. That being said, yeah, they're the a way, business. I use it no, please don't. <laughs> no, I know. Really, please, I know. please, please I know. don't. <laughs> I, I beg you. Um, no, but, but at the same time, it's a business. They're not pretending that they don't have an edge. And these are adults walking in right. and exactly. choosing to do that. It's not like the tobacco companies who were like, oh, no, they don't hurt you. Right. If you smoke menthols, that will be good for your cough. And meanwhile, they had all of this evidence that this was problematic. But now that they have the warnings, and it's very clear, someone who starts smoking today can't sue them anymore. They're an adult making a choice. This information is out there. It's not like the casino is saying, oh, sit down, please, because you have a 2.5% edge, right. when in act actuality, you don't. Yeah. And you know, it's even more so than that. The question is, if you're a casino, how do you know someone's, quote, addicted? How do you right. know they're a pathological gambler? In a bar, they're drunk. You know, um, one of the challenges I look at in a case like this is that, A, did the casinos know that this person was a pathological gambler? B, did that person say, I cannot be here anymore. I want to sign up for a self-exclusion list. I do not right, need your help. Right, which is help. a different, that's, it's totally and they're different. obligated by law. But that, yeah. they do have responsibility. If they say in the back room, we know this guy's a serious pathological gambler, and let's hit him with everything we got to get him to bleed his money here. So in other words, it would be the same thing if they said, he's got a heart disease, and let's just give him as much fatty foods and saturated fats so we can get stuff out of him. So there's a difference there. Mm -hmm. But I, I've been working with a number of uh, forensic cases exactly this, where the claimant has said, I'm going to sue the casino because they knew I had a gambling addiction and they kept serving me. And every single one of those cases, the judge has always thrown out and said, well, it doesn't really matter whether you, what happened here, whether the casino, the matter is that you had a disease, you have a responsibility to protect yourself from entering those casinos in the first place. Right. And because these casinos aren't dragging you in against your will, you are making a choice and you need to say, well, I do have a disease, therefore I can't even come close to this casino. So fascinating you question. You have the yeah. right to bar yourself from a casino. Yeah. yeah. And then, they're, then they're not allowed. But you actually can, no, but what I mean is you can tell the casino do not let me in here. Put you on a list. Right, right. Yeah. and then yeah. the casino actually, if they did let you in, then they would There'd be at be fault. So, so you have the right to, to bar yourself. Right. But I think it's as absurd as saying, like if I weigh 400 pounds and I go into a restaurant and I order chocolate cake for dessert, that if I walk out of there, that I'm allowed to sue them because they, well, they could see right. that I was, I was yeah. obese. Why, you let, why did you give me the yeah. chocolate cake that I ordered? Right. Mm -hmm. Now, I have had some patients claim, and I can't 
verify this, that casinos have offered them drugs, prostitutes, illegal activities, and again, the whole idea of casino markers and casino credit, they've offered them lots of that sort of thing. So again, that's a little bit of a gray area, which is why this whole situation, people tend to be polarized but, on either side with the casino or the But they do intoxicate you. I mean, I've been with gamblers who are rated at the casinos, as I'm sure you all have, are familiar with, where it's, you know, they're big rooms and there are limousines and there are you go sure. into the back door of the strip club and there's strippers waiting for you when you arrive and there's free food so it it goes be i mean it, it is an aggressive that push. just sounds like a reason to gamble for most people well that right? sounds like a reason to gamble no exactly <laughs> that's what i'm saying you know but, i'm not trying but to that's, but, but that's, it's their choice you know, but the business is allowed to maximize their profit they are, whatever I'm, they're going to do whatever calculations they need absolutely. to do to figure out how much yeah. money do i have to spend on you yeah. in order to make sure that you come here instead of Right. there or there or there yeah. and then you know they'll give kickbacks too so if you're a really big gambler they'll be like uh, you're playing at two and a half percent but we're going to give you back one percent of whatever yeah. you lose for example and they figure out where their line is that's just they're running a business uh, they don't absolutely but I'm just saying that that goes even further to and and you know not just the people who are pathological gamblers but the people that that like a great week and like to be treated well but over time it just it, it crushes them. I think just one thing to point out is that the number of people who are pathological gamblers who mm -hmm. engage in gambling activity is about it's like a magnitude less it's like about one tenth of the number of people who are addicted to um, alcohol who engage in drinking behavior. It's actually a very, very small segment of the population. I, I, I wish I we had that. more time to get into that yeah. because I would love to differentiate between gambling addictions and alcohol and drug addictions. Uh, but that, unfortunately, we don't have time for it. Hopefully we can delve into it on a yeah. future show. Uh, let's take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about uh, the government's monopoly on lotteries. Is it right? Our experts will weigh in on that and more. Welcome back to The Point. For our next point, we're going to talk about the marriage of gambling and government. Okay, The government has a bit of a monopoly when it comes to the lottery, and is that something that makes sense? Let's take a look at one of the commercials for the lotteries that recently aired. Ah! Oh. <laughs> Go directly to Fabulous. Play the new California Lottery Monopoly Scratchers, and you could win real big. First question goes to Michael. Michael, we've bought into the whole lottery system. Yeah. I remember at TYT, we recently all came together and bought lottery tickets. We didn't win anything. Right. Uh, but what do you think uh, commercials like that uh, really do to society? Like, what kind of message do they send? I don't know. I mean, they started in, in New York, I remember when they had the lottery. It was, it was a dollar and a dream. That was their thing. All it costs is a dollar and a dream. And, you know, uh, there are reasons to like it more than the casino industry because you spend a, a few dollars, it goes into the state education fund in most cases. That's getting a little too wonky about it. I mean, it is inviting people, generally people who don't have the, the money to afford, generally people who spend more and more. You look at scratcher tickets right now, there you can pay up to $10 for one ticket, where it used to just be a dollar. So it is inviting the dream to the people who can't get on a plane or a bus or a train to get to a casino. So uh, it does tap into that, and I'm sure Tim knows more about that. But to me, it's not, uh, it's not as offensive because of where the money goes. And listen, I mean, the funny things about these are we did it because it was like a half billion dollar lottery we bought a bunch of tickets in the office which was funny because if it let's say it's 23 million like, no that's not good enough for us we don't want to we're not going to buy tickets when it's 23 million dollars but it's a half billion dollars where our chances are exactly the same of getting those numbers you know I, I'm not offended by it because I, I find that where the money ends up is a little better than where the money might other way otherwise uh, go so what's really interesting about where the money goes is the fact that there have been these numerous studies about how the money doesn't it goes into education but at the same time a lot of uh, members uh, uh, or elected officials in these particular states the legislatures, or yeah. legislatures will or legislators will basically 
take money away from property taxes, put it into something else. Um, so they're like, okay, well, we'll depend on the education funding through the lottery system. But is that right? I mean, are, are they really increasing in my opinion, funding for not, education? In, in my opinion, it's not right. And listen, it's a very complicated issue right now, even on a federal level. I mean, there are people that are sort of putting an exclamation point on what Annie said earlier about poker being a game of skill, that there should be internet po poker that's legal. You have the senators from uh, Nevada, Harry Reid, and, and now Dean Heller who are pushing it through. And that would be contrary to what you'd think their interest would be because they want people to come to the casinos to play poker. They're doing it as a way of saying, all right, we'll do poker, but we're not going to do any of these games of chance. We're not going to do any of the other types of games. So it becomes a political issue where that money goes, how it's spent, and how it's regulated because they see uh, elusive tax dollars in every kind of gambling. See, it, right it's now. so interesting because I find the lottery so much more offensive than a casino. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think about it, because first of all, if you took the what's called the VIG, which is the amount of money that you're just pulling out of somebody's mm -hmm. bet, which you do per dollar. How much are you losing per dollar? You couldn't run that game in a Vegas casino. Right. Nobody would play it. Like, because they're taking such a high percentage of every dollar out, and it's not really going to education, as you just said. Schools have well, not gotten better since the lottery no, came they have, around. That's, that's the problem. A lot but, of the money is going to education. A lot of the money that wouldn't, that, that's being funneled out wouldn't be there to be funneled right. out. So, yeah, I mean, so, it, does the, it would strain the economy. The total percentage anyway. of the money of, at spent on education is so small. It's so, so small. They and less sell than it, but they sell, they it, sell as it that if, way. It's and then no rich of, people don't play the lottery unless it's like for five hundred billion dollars. Right. Like that's why you're. Yeah. But poor people play the lottery. People who are on welfare play the lottery. It is an incredibly regressive tax. Yes. So yeah. basically, you're saying, and we know that the balance of where money goes in terms of rich school districts versus poor school districts. Basically, you're having poor people pay for rich people's schools. Right if whatever money is actually making it to the schools. It's just a regressive tax, that's all it is. And they don't understand, like, I, they don't understand, hey, you do realize you're losing like 43% right. of every dollar that you spend. They're not thinking about it that but way. The, but then what about the idea of you'd rather give that money, even if it's two cents of every dollar, to the state fund in any type, uh, than give it to Sheldon Adelson to spend and give well, to, but I, I think that right. that's saying that that business doesn't present any value. Look, for the majority yeah. of people who gamble, it's entertainment. Yeah. So just like I go into a restaurant and I pay a certain amount of money because I don't want to cook and I have a steak dinner and I come away with something or I go to a movie and I come away with an experience. For most people, they go to Vegas once a year or once every couple years and they just have some blowout mm -hmm. weekend and it's really fun for them. And right, to say that right. that recreational value, that that's not presenting value to society, I think that's unfair. Also, nobody's really here, good here. at the lottery. Well, <laughs> I, I've had some patients who've had systems yeah. and they, you know, right. based on the numbers you see. But very simply, here's what we have in California. It's a $4 billion dollar a year industry, that's number one. Number two, it's gambling, it's, it's gambling. Right. Right. Number three, it's not that so much a tax, on, uh, a regressive tax, it's a tax on the mathematically weak. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, that's a much better is. way to put and it. So, and, but when you get down to where they're selling, that's the difference, they're selling it predominantly in lower socioeconomic that's places. Exactly right. yeah. And lastly, what, and this is fresh data we have from our state gambling treatment program here in California, the lottery is the number five form of gambling that our patients are talking about. The number one reason they're struggling is brick and mortar casinos, and then uh, followed by you know bookies and uh, home card games. But it's there; it's a legally sanctioned activity that is in fact causing a number of our Actually citizens to develop. Me it's as low as five. I mean, I would yeah. think that it would be higher. It would be than, higher. You wouldn't you know. because again, you know, part of it is because people don't dump hundreds of dollars in one shot. Right. They do it as a slow trickle. Right. You know, twenty, thirty dollars, and then eventually adds up. But rewind a few years ago when there was talk about privatizing our lottery here in California. Right. Talk about getting high-end scratchers, fifty to hundred dollars right. per scratch. Uh, reaching a point where we have video lottery terminals in every convenience store, um, libraries, hospitals, you name it. That's a shift in culture. And to me, sure. that's the biggest issue. Do we want to fashion our state? into more of a gambling culture because if you depend more on state revenue from lotteries and gambling, right. you have to go feed the beast. You have yeah, to I mean, get I've more. Seen, and not in California, but I was very shocked. I went back to New Hampshire, which is my home state, this fall, and I took a picture of it actually and posted it. It would, they have vending, lottery vending machines now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we'll so like, you so just many states that had outlawed any type of gambling had changed their tune after the economy was just destroyed. Yeah, I and think the reason why they Hawaii, that's all that's right. left. Yeah, it's kind of incredible. So they're depending on that type. And you know, you said regressive taxation. Maybe that's not the perfect wording, but that's essentially what it is. Because what's happening is, you know, our uh, elected officials are refusing to increase taxes on the wealthiest individuals in this country. A lot of our social programs, our education 
education is underfunded, and as a result of that, they need to make up the revenue somewhere else. Right. And they're doing so through gambling, they're doing so through casinos, and I have a huge, huge problem with that, especially because of what you mentioned, Danny, the fact that they're targeting, you know, the individuals that don't make much money to begin with. And, and you know, what Tim's saying is true. It's going beyond that. It's going, you know, the state of Delaware is actually legalizing online casino gambling, yes. games of chance. So, I mean, you could play roulette mm -hmm. and, and those games online in addition to the lottery. So you can buy lottery tickets online, play them online, and play casino games. Well, what I find is, I, I don't, you know, I don't know how I feel again, because I, sort of, I, I sort of stand by adults should be able to make adult choices. Right, and these are adults who are making adult choices. I don't like that they're preying on the mathematically challenged, as you said, but uh, you know. But I, I really believe, like, if you're making an adult choice, you should be able to make that choice. What I don't like is that the government picks and chooses its morality on on gambling. So they ban certain types of right. gambling, but then they're offering state lottery themselves. Yes. So you know, right. they're saying like, oh, um, for example, internet gambling has been a really big battle. Mm -hmm. Right about whether you should allow online poker, for example. Um, it was totally banned like two years ago. It was in a gray area before that. Yet, these were the same states that were offering internet lottery of their own. And it's like, where is that okay? And yeah. why is it okay for a state to have a brick and mortar casino but not an internet casino? What's the moral difference between placing a bet in a, in a casino and online? I don't yeah, see where that is. So I think it's a very let me just jump mor in morally quickly. slippery slope. It has absolutely nothing to do with morality. It has to do with the same thing that corrupts our right. politics today. It has to do with the money. Uh, just a few years ago, uh, there were several websites, fulltiltpoker.com. Uh, I don't remember which other websites, but we did a report on it. Um, basically, the reason why uh, those uh, online gambling sites were shut down by our FBI is because you have these casino owners in the background basically funding our politicians. So it has nothing to do with morality. It has to do with the money. So it, right. it, yeah, but they claim it's a moral issue. Right. So yeah. That's the problem. Well, sometimes so they do, but they, no. they're also pretty blatant, and it's okay that. It's it's about money in this case, I yeah. think. I think it's all right. I mean, Nevada should protect all the jobs and all the resources and all the tourist right. money that comes into Las Vegas and Reno and, and right. many other parts of that state as well as they can. And that's what their senators are sent to do and their representatives are but sent to do. No, Nevada does not have a lottery. No, they, they don't. Do, they do uh, not they have don't. a lottery. Yeah. And again, it goes, but the larger question is, how do we feel about the government tapping into our core human condition of what we want? Exactly. There's a reason. I don't know, in New Hampshire they said that it's state liquor stores too. Right. They, they so get it exactly. both ways. Virginia so, too. Virginia. So yeah. again, we're talking about people have a thirst and demand for gambling. That's human nature. It's not going to go away. When they package it like they do on that a commercial, commercial yeah. it sells the dream. You can't yeah. win if you don't play. And unfortunately what we know about the lottery winners, and they're starting to get more of those stories, Money doesn't buy happiness because right. money doesn't change mental health issues or family dysfunction or uh, you know, distorted views of the world. But again, when our government looks at casinos, alcohol, marijuana, you know, exotic dancing, golf, do we start taxing every single human interest we have for entertainment? Gambling at its healthiest is entertainment, an adult entertainment choice that you should make. But when you have a you know, all of these access, an incredible amount of access, it, it becomes to blur the line between dependency uh, for the state and could, but, could. but responsibility also on the part of the state for the people who... It's hugely. Yeah. So here in California, yeah. example, our uh, state lottery does contribute a certain percentage of money to funding the gambling treatment helpline. Other states, they take a certain percentage to go for gambling treatment. I'd like to see that number a lot bigger, but you know, it's, it's a start. But. One final question for you guys, and Annie, I'd, I'd like to ask you, do you feel like uh, gambling could possibly just be this nice uh, distraction from what the realities are in society right now? I mean, is it a way to give people hope when the economy is bad? Well, gambling is relatively recession-proof. That's not to say that Las Vegas is recession-proof, um, because Las Vegas depends on people being able to afford mm -hmm. to go to a hotel and whatever. But gambling itself is relatively recession-proof, I think, for the reason that you said. You know, in the same way that you know, people like to go to movies when things are bad, I think people like to sort of escape from reality and, and think about the thinking about all the great things that might happen, you know, I think is, is an escape for people. Um, you know, but you know, I mean, I always struggle and I always have struggled with, you know, do you have a responsibility to protect 
uh, this very small minority when the majority is gambling completely responsibly? My answer to that is no, as long, you know, as long as they haven't barred themselves from a casino. And in the case of the lottery, my issue is that the money that they're taking is used so incredibly inefficiently I, I just rather, I mean, it, it's just inefficiently used. There and are good so, state models, yeah. too, for what, for what, there are some yeah. states, Tennessee, for example, has had a success uh, when they tried to do something. I, it may have been Georgia, but I think it's Tennessee. Yeah. So there, there are models for better use of, of right, water Right, well, dollars. there's, you know, I mean, it, in general, the government's pretty bad at yeah, efficiently right. using our dollars. <laughs> so the, the fact that they're tapping into that piece to, to basically create another tax that's then money that's going to be used inefficiently for something that they say it's being used for, which is education, when the people who are mostly playing the lottery are experiencing just completely failing schools. It all just seems like a very broken system to me. All right, Annie, you get the last word on this segment. we got to take a quick break. Let's do that, and when we come back, Hollywood's depiction of gamblers. Welcome back to The Point. Our last and final point comes from Jeff Ma. He is the CEO and founder of 10Xer and a member of the legendary MIT Blackjack team that was profiled in the 2011 movie 21. Let's take a look at what he has to say. Hi, I'm Jeff Ma, CEO of 10Xer and the subject of the movie 21 and the book Bringing Down the House. And my point is that the problem with Hollywood is they have to glamorize everything and they miss the point a lot. And this is no, never tr more true than the world of gambling, where they've always got to portray it it's as bipolar. It's, it's people up, people down, it's people not using math, it's people not having any idea what they're doing. In the movie 21, one of the biggest things that they missed was that my character lost control. And because what we did was based on math and objective decision making and analytics, we would never have lost control. We weren't gambling. We are actually using math to beat the casinos. And everything that we did was unemotional. But it's not fun. It's not exciting for Hollywood to make things seem unemotional. So they make them emotional. They make people lose control. And they make gambling seem even darker than it is already. They do the same thing with you know, alcoholism or whatever. But gambling itself, many people make their money, make their living gambling these days. Like poker players like Annie Duke and like whomever else you have there. I'm sure they're very smart in the decisions they make. And they don't lose control. Again, 21, what we did was completely based on math and statistics, and we would never have lost control. And there are plenty of people, whether they're sports bettors, whether they're professional poker players, whether they're people who bet the uh, horses that use math and have an advantage. And when you have an advantage, it's not gambling anymore. It's actually just shrewd investing. And for some reason, Hollywood will never portray that because it's just not interesting. So my point is, I wish Hollywood could actually portray gambling for what it really is, a great way to make money if you know the math. So there have been many movies that uh, deal with the topic of gambling, Annie. And I have to ask you before we get to his point, which ones are your favorites, if there are any at all? Actually, I actually have two favorites, The Cincinnati Kid, because so you know, it's Steve yeah, McQueen, Edward G. Robinson. And also, it's a lesser known one, but I recommend people watch it, which is called The Big Hand for the Little Lady. Um, which is awesome. It has Henry Fonda in it, and oh, okay. so it's a con movie actually, right. but it's really good. So, what do you think about Jeff's point there? Do you, do you feel that uh, th th these movies glamorize gambling and kind of give you that sense that these people are mathematically challenged, as we talked about in the last episode or the last segment? Well, they definitely don't portray gambling properly. I mean, if you look at the Cincinnati Kid, for example, like the culminating, the big you know, a climax hand is like a straight flush against four of a kind. Like that just doesn't happen. It's normally like, oh look, you have a pair of tens right. and, and I have a pair of fives, you win. Um, that's like, it's much more boring and more small than that. Um, that being said, it's like suspension of disbelief. Like when I go see a movie and they outrun a fireball, I don't think that's actually obeying the law of physics. So I'm not expecting to go see a gambling movie thinking that I'm going to see good gambling. So right. I don't have the same sort of enraged. The only time I got upset was when I watched Rounders because they were sort of selling it as this is the realistic view of gambling. And it really actually wasn't very realistic. Um, but it was better than most. But that sort of bothered me. I want you just either to go, like, this is entertainment or yeah. not. 
So Jeff Ma, of course, makes a lot of great points. Of, uh, Hollywood has to glamorize things, otherwise the movie wouldn't be interesting. There has right, to be right. some sort of drama. But did you guys get the sense that he was a little bitter about the way he was portrayed? Because he seems like an intelligent yeah, dude. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. But, but I mean, he's like, I didn't lose control. Uh, but yeah. it, but it, would yeah. you have wanted to see the movie that he just fleshed out at the end of his not little... At not at all. It, no, sounds, no, it no. it sounds like a math class. And, I don't want to yeah, see yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. So I was definitely... So that's what Hollywood's role is to do. I mean, I absolutely... Listen, I, Guys and Dolls, yeah. one of the best movies based on gambling and it was basically about a, cra a crap game yeah. uh, when you play craps you don't I mean I do but go do a big number and sing I mean <laughs> um, it's, that's not that's not what happens uh, in gambling so I, I think that he has to be a little more forgiving to Hollywood so since these Hollywood movies do glamorize gambling a little bit how does that feed into gambling addiction do you do you think that it has uh, any type of role in feeding gambling addiction? You know, it's never actually been formally studied. I mean, all the patients I've worked with, very rarely have they said, oh, I was watching a movie and then it primed me to want to go gambling. Um, I actually like <laughs> two very good movies. Uh, one's called The Gambler with James Caan and the other one's called Owning Mahoney. Uh, and these are very good, realistic depictions of gambling addiction, per se. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they did okay in the box office, but they really show the chasing, the loss of control, the uh, as an audience member, you're like, why don't you just get it and just stop? So I think they're very, very good. It's but kind of like all the video poker and all the video blackjack. You don't hear people blaming that for gambling. Like people talk about videos, video games and yeah. guns. You yeah. know, it's there's not a lot. Of video movies and, yeah. So there's not a lot. But you know, it's interesting. A lot of like Hong Kong movies. There's this whole series called The God of Gamblers. And it's a whole series where they use magic and spells and powers to basically win at the at the last hand. It's very dramatic and things like that. But so I think, you know, it's an interesting area. But when you look at the genre of gambling movies that on near Netflix, it's much smaller than the it's genre for, for, for alcohol. It. Yeah, exactly. It's like just it's hard to depict it in an interesting way because gambling is actually really boring. Like you're just sitting right. there doing yeah. the same thing over and over again. So yeah. you have to create all these weird devices to make it interesting. Um, but he seemed to be very bitter that he was like, oh, I didn't lose control. Like he, that was, he was very concerned about like, no, that's not what it is. It has to be exactly that yeah. depiction. But mm -hmm. that would I'm be really that's why there aren't very many gambling movies because it's just not very they, interesting yeah. to watch somebody gambling. It's really boring. You know, I, I don't know how he is in life right now, but in our world, sometimes we call that denial. You know, when people come out and they're really obsessed. That's not how it was. This is not how it is meant to be. But mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure he's doing pretty well. Their, their operation <laughs> was very clinical. I read yeah. the book. I didn't see the movie. So I, I see it in the same way again, going back to what Annie said, what, what I do is in gambling. They're, they're good at something. Um, they are not among the mathematically challenged, yeah. uh, like I am and like the rest of us lottery players are. But the, the idea that, that it wouldn't make a good movie is true. I mean, you, you could watch, I, if you watch the World Series of pork, Poker, you probably are amazed that people watch the World Series I of Poker. I can't believe yeah. that people, like people are like, oh, do you watch poker on TV? I'm like, no. Yeah. It's just like hours and hours yeah. and hours and yeah. hours of the same yeah. thing over and over right. again. Yeah. It's really boring, but people like watching it, so mm. I, you know, and keep to, watching it. Yeah, and they cut in the good hands yeah. and the close hands yeah. and the personalities and everything. But when you, if you're, and the thing that's fun about poker for me when I play is because I play with friends, you know, mm -hmm. and we just sit and talk the whole time and, and you know, shoot. Yeah. The breeze. Yeah. One of the things that Jeff mentions there, it goes back to the stigma that a lot of people have about gamblers in general. So if you're a gambler, you're seen as degenerate, or yeah. in your case, you know, something worse than that, you know, right? <laughs> but I mean, I think that's really generous. highlighted. Generous. And, and, and that's the thing, the professional gambler, just in the last five years, has changed from being this degenerate, overweight, middle-aged man to, you know, a, a, a female heroine in some ways. And so, our society has changed that, but there's still a lot of elements. I mean, I get that a lot as a physician. They'll say, well, what do you do? Oh, I'm like, well, I specialize in treatment of compulsive gamblers. And they're always saying, well, why don't you just do depression or anxiety? So there's still a lot of societal stigma about people who choose to do gambling either as a living or yeah. as a uh, very uh, much of a passion. So did you, do you gamble? Have you ever gambled? Is there any appeal to you? Oh, absolutely. I firmly believe you study what you know. And I, I come from a family of gamblers. I come from a family where there's pathological gamblers as well. I gamble myself and I know a lot about it. I gamble every day. You know, do I take the freeway or surface streets to get to the studio? So That's such a huge gamble. It, it's <laughs> all that we do. You You're know. like, it's 11.30. Why is the 101 so crowded? This yeah. doesn't make sense. Is there innocent gambling, though? I mean, like, my friend Ben, I'll, I'll not 
say his last name. But let's pronounce. The audience has no idea. Let's, let's pretend. Is. Let's pretend it's Mankiewicz. All right. Um, <laughs> that he and I will sit outside, have a sandwich, and bet. You know, five dollars on whether there will be ten American cars or ten foreign cars that pass us yeah. while we're there, or will the next? You know, we'll sit on a Southwest flight and we will bet five dollars on how many. Set an over under how many people with facial hair are going to walk on the plane yeah. and count them as they come on. So, w I mean, there is the fun kind of innocent side of gambling. Does that always lead to? The monster that Ben has become? No, I wouldn't say that. that always, Ben's over there right no, now. No, of course. no, no, absolutely not. I mean, that, at its core, that's what gambling is. It's about yeah. healthy entertainment. It's about recreation. It's about risk taking. If anything, we we need to do more of that as a country. Yeah. But what we don't need is gambling where it's pathological. Where you're gambling to take away stress and depression. You're gambling to right. take away a core conflict about yourself. And that's a huge, huge difference. So, right. absolutely, uh, by all means, I think those are the sorts of things that we really Thank need God. to do more of. <laughs> All right, well, this has been a fascinating discussion. I certainly learned a lot, especially since I didn't know much about gambling to begin with. And I want to thank you guys for joining us today. Tim Fong, uh, please tell our audience if there's anything you're working on, anywhere you know, you'd know you like to direct them to to find out more about you. Absolutely. So I'm co-director of our UCLA Gambling Studies Program. Uh, we study uh, all causes of pathological gambling. We also have a statewide program here in California that treats gambling addiction that can be accessed through 1-800-GAMBLER. Um, so we're always interested in talking to more people about this uh, um, issue that we're really passionate about. Excellent. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Annie Duke, tell the audience a little more about you. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to encourage people to gamble more. <laughs> <laughs> Please buy my books on poker. Um, I've got Decide to Play Great Poker and The Middle Zone, which are both. You can find them on Amazon. And uh, you can learn to play to an advantage then so that you won't be gambling. Do you promise? I love it. I do <laughs> promise. Okay. It's a promise. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, Michael Shore, I don't know where anyone's going to find you. I don't know where you're going to find me. Uh, bet the over in Frank Gore's total yards in the Super Bowl. Uh, no, I, uh, you'll find me on Current, uh, current TV, theyoungturks.com. Watch uh, politics. And Follow me on Twitter, at Michael Schultz. Watch politics. Watch yeah, watch politics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank watch you, politics. our epic politics man. Uh, and so I also want to thank our great point contributors, uh, Steve Tromans of JustBeWell.com and Jeff Ma, who you can read more about in uh, the book Bringing Down the House, or you can find out more about his company at 10xer.com. I'm Anna Kasparian. Thank you so much for joining us today. You guys can check me out on The Young Turks Monday through Friday at YouTube.com slash TYT Live. Please share your comments, share your thoughts. We love to get feedback from you guys, and we'll see you next week.